Many had criticisms of this man, Herodotus, known as the father of history. He wrote a series of histories which described the world known to the Greeks, and most famously, the Persian Wars. One section attracts the most attention, Herodotus's description of the Great Battle of Marathon in 490 BC, during which the outnumbered Greeks stood firm against the forces of Darius and the powerful Persian Empire, left nearly alone to defend the Hellenic world. In this colorful account, we meet the runner Philippides, who jogs to Sparta to seek aid. We hear of the tactics of the Greeks to force a Persian retreat, during which the Hellenes, quote, were seized by utterly self-destructive madness. And we hear of an ordinary soldier, a Pizelis, who claims he was passed by a spirit on the battlefield, a spirit which takes the life of an enemy, and in exchange, Epizelus's eyesight for the rest of his life. The writing is gripping, but to Herodotus's detractors like Plutarch and Thucydides, his work has deep flaws. It had malice and made up stories. Even Cicero, who gave Herodotus the nickname Father of History, said his histories were full of innumerable, fabulous tales. And yet, Herodotus lingers with us today. Even if you aren't familiar with him, his name probably strikes a bell. He created a discipline. His work, compiled as The Histories, is known to many as the first history, perhaps better phrased, the first modern history. And his tagline from Cicero, the father of history, is a heuristic with duration. But is it an accurate label? Herodotus was born around 484 BC and grew up in Halicarnassus, which was across the Aegean Sea from Athens, Western Turkey today, and was of the Persian Empire. It was nonetheless on the edge of the Greek world, and Herodotus's native tongue was probably the Ionic Greek in which he wrote. A 10th century Byzantine encyclopedia tells us something different. He learned the Ionian dialect on the island of Samos. Regardless, he was clearly a man of mixed cultures. Adding to this mix, Herodotus was well-traveled. He probably saw not only nearby spots like the island of Samos, but ventured to Athens and the ancient city of Turi in modern-day Italy. For the purpose of his history, he likely surveyed part of the Mediterranean, Asia Minor, North Africa, maybe more. This adventuring spirit must have contributed to his use of varied viewpoints in his writing. Being born in roughly 484 means Herodotus was an infant during the Persian War he recounted in his histories. He was therefore not a direct observer of events, but did speak to direct observers and as we know, visited many of the places of which he wrote. The Greek word historie means inquiry, and through this lens, the histories of Herodotus can be seen more clear. His explanations of people and events, sure, but also his investigation of geography, rivers, culture, a splash of mythos. It's an attempt at a holistic narrative. While today we might try to academically silo some of these items, and not for improper reasons, his ambition is still impressive, to me at least. He was curious. His curiosity bleeds out of the page. Herodotus also gives us motivation at the start of his histories. It's a bit like a preface of a modern nonfiction book, explaining why he wrote. Quote, Herodotus of Halicarnassus here presents his research so that human events do not fade with time. May the great and wonderful deeds, some brought forth by the Hellenes, the Greeks, others by the barbarians, not go unsung, as well as the causes that led them to make war on each other. We'll talk about that pesky word barbarian soon. To show how unique Herodotus's research approach is, consider another famous Greek epic that came before, Homer's Iliad from the 7th or 8th century BC. How does the Iliad begin? Quote, o sing goddess Achilles's rage, which brought countless ills. O sing goddess from the Iliad versus Herodotus presents his research. I'm not suggesting Herodotus was a secular atheist. He does give attention to legend, but to focus on human events, human causes through inquiries, present his research, Herodotus offers a fundamentally different project. The Iliad opens with a line about legends. It's a poem passed down. Herodotus, in contrast, opens with an admission. Here is a display of my inquiry. It's comprehensive, new. Of course, Herodotus wasn't the first person to write down facts about a place he had predecessors. It's not like people didn't keep records before Herodotus. Oh dang, we should have written this down, gee. Thanks, Herodotus. <laughs> For example, Hecateos, uh, butchered that name, wrote a work called Genealogies before Herodotus's time. But most immediate predecessors 
probably didn't use contemporary or eyewitness sources when reporting on an event. Another angle, there's evidence that before Herodotus, there were local historians in the world known to the Greeks, crafting histories limited geographically, maybe thematically a bit myopic. Perhaps they wrote about things before the respective historian's time. We don't really know because their works are lost to us. So Herodotus's histories is a unique work among known works, and it's the earliest work of this kind we can actually read ourselves. He broadens the scale considerably, treating us to tales from all over. It's epic, but it's not an epic. The further we go back, the more we're resigned to poetry like that of Homer or inscriptions on tablets without an observer or narrator to guide us through. It's kind of like what we're doing now. I would never be so pretentious as to compare myself with Herodotus, but I've picked up the pieces here and I'm trying to deliver them to you as a story. You aren't, I don't know, excavating the ruins yourself or singing a song to your cousin about a legend passed down through the ages. Herodotus wrote about the world he knew and he lent his voice and his guidance through the material. Here is the most straightforward explanation I found explaining what makes Herodotus's histories unique. It's found in the preface by Dr. Rosalind Thomas in this, the landmark Herodotus, source three below. I had to read the landmark Thucydides in grad school and both books are really helpful. Quote, the histories are the first work in the Western tradition that are recognizably a work of history to our eyes, for they cover the recent human past as a opposed to a concentration on myths and legends. They search for causes and they are critical of different accounts. So one, recent history, two, inquiring about what happened, and three, doing so by weighing sources of information. That's historical work in a nutshell. And while we have king's lists and epic poetry from far further back, Herodotus's iteration of communicating the past was new. Being unique and first to market, so to speak, Herodotus acquired haters. Generations of famous philosophers, orators, and writers had opinions of Herodotus. Like, all the famous names are here for the roll call. Thucydides, Aristophanes, Aristotle, Plutarch, Cicero. Cicero gave Herodotus the moniker, father of history, but also claimed Herodotus was an exaggerator. Quote, in the works of Herodotus, the father of history, one finds innumerable fabulous tales. Plutarch wrote a piece called On the Malice of Herodotus in which he accused him of calumnious fiction and bias. Thucydides wrote a generation after Herodotus and picks up the story in his famous History of the Peloponnesian War. Despite the clear lineage and iterative process, Thucydides also had a negative or at least rivalry-based opinion of Herodotus. Never mentioning him by name, he nonetheless strongly implied Herodotus's delineations and anecdotes in his history were made up. For this reason, rather than the detours and cultural moments we get in Herodotus, Thucydides stays mostly in the lane of political history. In his poetics, Aristotle took time to distinguish the philosophical process from the historical process. Now, some argue whether he meant to put history down or just to define it as different, but the point is that he lived after Herodotus, when a history as such could be distinguished. Finally, Aristophanes, the same guy who accused Socrates of sophistry and flatulation in one of his ancient Greek plays, satirized Herodotus too. Herodotus explained in book one of his histories that the animosity between the Greeks and Persians can be traced to a kidnapping of three women. A character in an Aristophanes play gave a similar explanation of the situation that caused a war, but the women in this version were sex workers. Nice one, Aristophanes. Got him. So yeah, Herodotus was a trailblazer and gathered haters. But it hasn't only been people of antiquity who had thoughts on Herodotus. Historians through the ages have spent considerable time examining the reliability of Herodotus's account. Spoilers, some of what he said was true, some false, some we don't know. His bias was clear, he was pro-Greek, but he didn't dehumanize the non-Greeks. In fact, he did a lot of humanizing of the barbarians, the other. Let's dwell there for just a second. Herodotus often calls the Persians barbarians. Like we already read together at the opening of the book, Herodotus hopes that through his histories, quote, may the great and wonderful deeds, some brought forth by the Hellenes, others by the barbarians, not go unsung. Since when do barbarians do wonderful deeds? Of course, in English, we think of the word barbarian. It's 
pejorative, negative, uncivilized, dirty. Maybe we flip the script and imagine it's how colonizers describe the colonized, the language of the powerful to describe the scary unknown, barbarians. But Herodotus seems to use it differently. Book five and six of his histories involves one, some Greeks in Anatolia rebelling against the Persians, the Ionian Revolt, and two, the Persian attempts to sack Athens and eventually Sparta. But despite his obvious pro-Greek bias against the invaders, we get some samples of balance. During the Ionian resistance of Persia, we're told about how some Greeks burned a temple, and that the Persians use this as justification for their burning of sanctuaries. It's not so much a justification of Persian desecration of shrines as a non-avoidance of the Greeks doing it first. We're also given a glimpse of the governing policies of the Persians after the revolt was put down, namely some moderate imperial governance, including limited democracy. Barbarians. When discussing the planned Persian invasion of Sparta, Herodotus mentions stories of helots, kind of like Spartan serfs, forced labor. In a narrative that claims this was a war to maintain Greek independence, Persian victory might have felt less like a subjugation to the helots and perhaps more like a emancipation. Barbarians. In Herodotus, we even get an anecdote of a Persian king crying with compassion at the fragility and ephemerality of the human condition. Barbarian? What are we to make of all this? The word barbarian carries a lot of baggage to us, but it might be useful to translate the word as foreigner, less pejorative. If that's too far, take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Pillaging imperial armies? Barbarians. Humanizing anecdote? Foreigner. Was Herodotus biased? Yeah. Was Herodotus a hopeless chauvinist xenophobe? Nah, man, I, I don't think that's likely. Another thing that goes to Herodotus's credit is that he often opted not to declare anything as absolutely true. He wrote when he believed something to be true and when he didn't. He reported some fantastical tales as reality and expressed doubt about others. It lends credibility because only the Sith deal in absolutes. Here's an example of Herodotus giving a caveat. He reported on a battle and wrote, quote, I am unable to record precisely which Ionians proved themselves to be coward or brave and valiant men in this encounter, for they now all reproach one another. He's basically saying, man, I don't know the truth. They all argue with each other. Another example, quote, I cannot say whether it was because the Athenians had dealt with the heralds in this way, but in my opinion, it was not on account of what they had done to the heralds. Maybe it was this way. Maybe it wasn't. He was more intellectually honest than his critics would have us believe. He deserves the father of history label. On that note, if you're interested in history and have never spent time with Herodotus or his intellectual successor Thucydides, I can't give a higher recommendation than you should. I'll leave a link in the description. Of course, their works can be found for free online with various translations, but a landmark version offers thoughtful translation, guidance, maps. It takes away some of your mental load so that you can enjoy the prose, the story, and the genuine passion for knowledge that defines not only the mind of Herodotus, but so many great writers whom we celebrate. I see similarities between Herodotus's histories and Tolstoy's War and Peace from over 2,000 years later. An ability to zoom in, close, interpersonal, intimate, then zoom out, describe a battle, then give an opinion and finish with flourish. There's something else. Herodotus's histories are beautiful in their imperfection. Today, if you want to be a professional historian, a paper writing scientist, a pop musician, you have to go in a box and create in a certain way that is recognized. Innovate a tad, but don't go too far. The trail is traced. But Herodotus wrote in a time which gave him freedom to iterate, to do something new, to fall in love with people and places and put words about that love on paper. And that's all I really want to do in my life. So I like reading him. And if that's your vibe, you should read him too. Later, y'all.